people think that goes away in April with the heat. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Shazda Chidello. As Joe Biden prepares to take office, Donald Trump continues to claim without evidence that the election was stolen. But most of the rest of the world is moving on. We'll be speaking to a former senator about what the fledgling Biden administration should do. And we'll look at the deepening COVID crisis, the new vaccine, and Biden's plans for the pandemic. But first... It took an agonising three and a half days, counting an unprecedented number of mail-in votes, but... Just before midday U.S. time Saturday, they finally called it. CNN projects Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States. And it wasn't just fake news, CNN. The former Vice President Joe Biden will win Pennsylvania and Nevada, putting him over the 270 electoral votes he needs to become the 46th president of the United States. And here's how Biden did it. He won back the blue wall, flipping upper Midwest and Wisconsin, Michigan, and eventually Pennsylvania. Fox and the Associated Press went out on a bit of a limb early, calling Arizona another former Trump state. Biden held on to Nevada and he still leads in Georgia, while President Trump looks like holding on in North Carolina. With the counting continuing so far, Biden leads by almost 5 million votes nationally, over three points overall, with a few million more to come in from big blue states like California and New York too. So the most likely electoral college count at the end of this is probably Joe Biden, 306, Donald Trump, 232. Coincidentally, the numerical reverse of the 2016 result, although three Trump electors turned faithless that year, so he ended up with 303. Still, as the TV networks began to call the election for Joe Biden, President Trump was unwinding with a round of golf in Virginia, but not before tweeting that his legal team had a big announcement. Lawyers News Conference, Four Seasons, Philadelphia, 11 a.m. The Four Seasons Hotel in Philadelphia was then swamped with media inquiries, but they knew nothing about any press conference. Soon, another tweet clarified the news conference would in fact be at... Four Seasons Total Landscaping, 11.30 a.m. A weird choice of location. It certainly seemed to have confused the president. It confused reporters too when they arrived at a parking lot in a small industrial estate next to an adult bookshop and a crematorium. Cue Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer. What's this all about, Rudy? There was no inspection of a single mail-in ballot. Those mail-in ballots could have been for anybody. And his evidence? Well, there was none. But Rudy alleges that's because poll watchers were kept six feet away from the ballot counters and they couldn't see. Like this guy. We saw people working on, on the ballots, but we didn't know any names. We didn't see anything. We don't know if people voted uh, twice or three times. We didn't know if people were dead, people were voting. So an understandable frustration. He's a Republican poll watcher and he doesn't feel as though he could watch the polls properly. But given we're in the middle of a pandemic, understandable as well that officials didn't want a bunch of people breathing down their necks. But let's remember, the insinuation here suggests the official poll workers are a part of a massive conspiracy. And Rudy says his inability to prove fraud is itself proof of fraud. One of the things that does involve fraud is not making it uh, possible for the people who are supposed to inspect to inspect. That's a fraud. That's a fraud on the voters. Oh, and that poll watcher's name, by the way, is Daryl Brooks. He describes himself as an activist. A judge described him, though, as a sex offender. Brooks was jailed for three and a half years for offences including sexual assault and public masturbation. That may tend to raise questions about how thoroughly Giuliani's team are vetting these claims or claimants, which are so far lacking in substance. They cited just one possible case of a person's mail-in vote being requested after their death and then counted. Still, according to the New York Times, Giuliani really did plan the event for the landscaping firm, not the hotel, for reasons that are still unclear, though. When he told the president it was going to be at the Four Seasons, the president, quote, misunderstood, assuming it was an upscale hotel. It certainly gave the event an appropriately surreal air, particularly when Rudy was then told the election had been called. The call for Joe Biden isn't... Is Who was it called by? All the... Oh, my goodness! All the networks! Wow! All the networks!
<laughs> the real story behind this presser is a bit of a mystery. I'm not sure anyone's really buying what Trump's team told the landscaping place, that their location was close to an exit on I-95 and was secure, and that's why Giuliani wanted to use it. They also told the New York Times that the campaign has always intended to hold the presser in that friendlier part of town because they were sick of having pressers drowned out by large pro-Biden crowds. Well, that bit at least rings true because I think I know what presser they're referring to. <laughs> Changing things from that setup probably wasn't a bad idea, John. Yeah, I was thinking maybe it had something to do with the crematorium and dead people voting, but no, <laughs> who knows. Enter Attorney General Bill Barr at that point after a couple of weeks of keeping a relatively low profile. Yesterday, Barr told US attorneys investigations, quote, may be conducted if they are clear and apparently credible allegations of irregularities that, if true, could potentially impact the outcome of a federal election in an individual state. Now, that is a departure from usual Justice Department policy, which prohibits federal prosecutors from taking overt steps to open a criminal investigation into any election-related matter until after voting results have been certified. And that prompted the Justice Department official who oversees investigation of voter fraud, Richard Pilger, to resign. Meanwhile, President Trump is still crying foul and refusing to concede. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. Yeah, this was literally the tweet that Trump put up only minutes before Biden was recognised as president-elect by the major news networks. I won this election by a lot! And he is continuing to launch a number of unlikely Hail Mary lawsuits, which of course is his right. Most of them so far have been rejected or would be unlikely to result in a different election outcome, even if they were successful. But if one of them does have real legs, we'll let you know. The strange thing for me is that we've seen a number of leaks from his aides describing the push as a slapdash legal effort without enough forward planning. Now that's very odd, because Trump has openly foreshadowed this strategy for months. In fact, the only thing this legal effort has achieved so far is to raise money from fundraising emails supposedly sent out by Donald Trump Jr. Of course, in the fine print of those emails, it says 50% of any contribution will be used for general election campaign debt retirement. So it's all a bit reminiscent of much of Trump's presidency. Poorly organised, chaotic, and you're never quite sure when he's on the grift. But Trump's people have assured Fox News that when it's over, it'll be over. I'm told that when he goes through this legal process, mm -hmm. if there is no path to a second term, then the president will graciously concede and he will uh, cooperate in an orderly uh, transition of power. We will see about that. But fair enough, he should be able to pursue his legal options before conceding. What I'm less wild about is the leader of the House Republicans declaring against all reality that Trump has already won. Trump won this election, so everyone who's listening, do not be quiet. Do not be, do not be silent about this. We cannot allow this to happen before our very eyes. We unite together. Now, you don't need to be a Republican. You believe in every legal vote needs to count. You believe in the American process join together and let's stop this. I'm even less of a fan of opinion leaders like talk radio host Mark Levin heavily insinuating that state legislatures should overrule the popular vote when awarding election college electors. He said to Republican state legislatures, you have the final say over the choosing of electors, Article 2 of the Federal Constitution. So get ready to do your constitutional duty. And that, John, was retweeted by Donald Trump Jr. Of course it was. Yes. Needless to say, while state legislatures can choose the method by which electors are chosen, they probably can't change the rules after the election has been held, John. Yeah, reasonable comment. Regardless, <laughs> though, Joe Biden is getting on with the task of forming a new administration and trying to act as though everything's normal. Folks, the people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we the people. We've won with the most votes 
ever cast on presidential ticket in the history of the nation. And many world leaders agree. The UK's Boris Johnson, Canada's Justin Trudeau, Australia's Scott Morrison, Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu, all congratulating Biden and Harris and ignoring Trump's protests. So far, Trump's Republican allies, though, have been generally more circumspect than that in a possible sign of things to come. The usual suspects, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, giving their congratulations, while the likes of Mitch McConnell are giving Biden bubkis and defending the president's right to challenge the result. And President Trump is 100% within his rights to look into allegations of ir irregularities and weigh his legal options. Indeed, but Biden has hit the ground running nevertheless. He's already indicated that he'll issue a bunch of executive actions immediately upon his inauguration. He'll rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, he'll rejoin the World Health Organization, he'll repeal the Trump travel bans, he'll reinstate the Dreamers program to protect people brought to America illegally as children. Slightly more worrying, his people are already talking about continuing on with Trump's habit of appointing lots of acting cabinet members instead of trying to get them through the Senate properly. We'll see about that one. The other issue is when Biden's transition gets actually started. The General Services Administration needs to sign paperwork to officially give Biden's transition team access to government officials, office space to work in, the necessary computer equipment to use, $9.9 .9 million cash for salaries, government email addresses, and the ability for his nominees to start filling out disclosure forms. And the administrator in question is as yet refusing to do so. I'm not sure it's a massive issue yet. Biden only unofficially won the election a few days ago, but this could start to become an issue soon. And if it does, let me just note that Richard Nixon in 960 pursued his legal options after he accepted reality and allowed everyone else to move on. So it can be done. Yeah, Nixon didn't want to look like a sore loser so he could run again. Maybe there's a lesson there. But even if this election is finally over or will be in a month when the Electoral College formally votes and certifies and any legal challenges will be irrelevant, it's still not really over. There will be runoff elections for two Senate seats in the state of Georgia after no candidate won the required 50% for an outright victory. And at stake is Joe Biden's only shot at a working Democratic Senate majority. After losing in Alabama, Democrats won Colorado and Arizona. So it is 48 Democrats to 49 Republicans, with Alaska taking their sweet time to count, and those two in Georgia outstanding. If the Senate is tied 50-50, then Vice President Kamala Harris has the casting vote. And those Georgia Senate races are a factor as well in the legal machinations we're seeing at the moment, including the recount in Georgia. Republicans simply don't want Trump supporters to feel like they've given up on them. They need them to turn out again in January. But Meanwhile, Chaz, it's fair to say that Democrats didn't just underperform expectations in the Senate, where they were given about a 76% chance by 538 of winning a majority, but Republicans did better than a lot thought possible in the House of Representatives and in a bunch of state-based races as well. And it may well be that they can thank Donald Trump for boosting overall turnout and they just went through on his coattails. Look, it's true. It's all upside for Republicans in the House at the moment. They were expected to lose five to ten seats there, but they've gone from a 232 to 197 seat deficit to only being down 218 to 201 so far. And in the remaining seats, Republicans are leading 11 to 5. So Democrats have won a majority, but maybe only by five or six seats, which would place Nancy Pelosi at the mercy of any group of showboaters in the House. And trust me, there are a lot of showboaters in the House. Do they have Trump's turnout to thank for that result? Maybe they do, but Republicans in the House did better than Trump. So far, Trump's down 3.1% on the popular vote, but House Republicans are only down 1.7%. Both those numbers will probably blow out a little, though, over the next few weeks. Also in the Senate, most of the competitive Senate seats that Republicans won saw the Senate candidate on the right there outperforming Trump on the left there. Especially Susan Collins in Maine, who outperformed Trump by 18 points. I might add, all those candidates were severely outspent by Democrats as well. These are just the amounts the Democratic candidate alone raised. No super PACs. So, once again, Republicans down the ballot had a much better election than Trump did. 
Yeah, fascinating result. Earlier today, President-elect Biden downplayed concerns about legal action and the withholding of transition funds, and even comments like this from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. There will be a smooth transition to a second Trump administration. Now, if you just saw that bit, you'd be freaking out, and Twitter certainly is today, but Pompeo continued with a smirk and a reassurance. All right, we're, we're ready. The, the world is watching what's taking place here. We're going to count all the votes. When the process is complete, there'll be electors selected. There's a process. The Constitution lays it out pretty clearly. So, was he joking or not? Well, Joe Biden clearly did not take it seriously. <laughs> Secretary of State Pompeo. Well, for more on where we're up to today, we're joined by former Democratic Senator for North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, a friend and supporter of Joe Biden. Senator Heitkamp, welcome back to Planet America. Well, thanks for having me. So what do you make of this situation? Joe Biden declared president-elect by media outlets, President Trump refusing to concede and desperately looking for any court that'll take a case. <laughs> um, it's just more chaos. It, it was a chaos presidency and it's going to be chaos until the end. And everybody in his party goes along with it, um, you know, under this idea that you humor him until he leaves. Unfortunately for us, this is our democracy. Um, and we expect people to behave like adults. Um, and that's hardly what's happening here. Well, presumably Biden is about to become president. So what's the one act that Biden could perform alone as president without the Senate that you think would make the most positive difference to America? I think that, that um, his main goal is to unite America again, to bring us to common purpose. Um, we're confronting you know, a, a ravaging outbreak of COVID-19. Um, uh, just, just alone in my state, we have had a record number of deaths just today. And so I think he has put the emphasis exactly where it needs to be, which is on public health and gathering all the public health experts. I expect that he is going to spend a lot of time with the governors, um, which I think is very smart because Washington is, uh, is a swamp and it's all about power, but governors need to get things done. And so I expect that um, Joe Biden will focus on uh, the coronavirus outbreak and the pandemic with the idea that if you can solve that problem, once again, you can get your economy going. Um, and then after that, it's going to be a big discussion, I think, about infrastructure and a big discussion about stimulus. Obviously, we don't yet know what's going to happen in Georgia, but clearly President Biden is not going to have the kind of Senate majority he would have liked. So what is he going to do to get anything done? I think that Joe Biden has to not um, uh, not work with the Republican caucus through Mitch McConnell. I think he needs to go directly to Republican members. Um, there's a whole lot of Republican senators who are tired of the inaction. And I expect that they'll be willing to step up and, and actually work with um, this administration, whether it is on agricultural issues, whether it is on water development, whether it's on infrastructure. I think if you pick the right issues, I think that we can move this country forward. So the Democrats might have won the presidency, but they didn't win the Senate and they almost lost the House. How do you explain those vastly different results between the state level and the federal level? You know, it's really it's 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 really hard. And, and I think, uh, you know, I get in trouble with some of my Democratic colleagues. I think that we need to go back to those issues that really created the modern day Democratic Party, which is uh, New Deal issues, working family issues. I think it's really important that we find the right priorities and, and kind of hopefully redefine the Democratic Party as not a party of extreme, but the party of the working people who really care about the future of our country and making sure we're addressing things like income inequality, like access to health care, like making sure we have equal education opportunities for our kids. And Senator, can I ask you to reflect upon what you think a Biden presidency and a Kamala Harris vice presidency will mean for America? I think it's a really dynamic duo. Uh, you know, Joe, who has been around a long time, um, everybody knows him. Everybody knows, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because if you talk to people, people will say, he's my friend. And he really is everybody's friend. And but he also is very much respectful of institutions. And, you know, Kamala Harris uh, is an incredibly talented person. And, and I consider her a very good friend um, and uh, has a very diverse background. 
uh, whether it's in law enforcement, whether it is working on childhood trauma. I mean, she really understands the complexities of these issues and will bring, I think, that perspective to the table in the Biden administration. So I expect it's not going to be the same old, same old because she's at the table, but we're going to get back to some normalcy. Senator Heidi Heidkamp, thank you for joining us on Planet America. Thanks so much, and you guys take care. And a lot of you have been asking, is Heidi Heitkamp going to be Joe Biden's Agriculture Secretary? As reported this week, we did ask her about that. She was very diplomatic and coy. We didn't really get anything out of that. You can check it out yourself on Facebook. But when Joe Biden does take the oath of office in January next year, at 78, he will become the oldest ever person to serve as President of the United States. In fact, he will start his presidency older than the previous oldest president, Ronald Reagan, was when he left the presidency. Fair to say, it has been a very long road to the White House for Joe Biden. The youngest new face in the U.S. Senate next year will be that of Democrat Joseph Biden of Delaware. So young, in fact, that at the time of his election on November 7th, Biden was not yet old enough to serve. That constitutional problem was resolved on November 20, 1972. Happy the boy's looking father of three young children was celebrating his 30th birthday. That makes him just old enough to be a United States Senator, 30 being the minimum age prescribed by the Constitution. And the second youngest person ever elected to the Senate was confident other members wouldn't hold his age against him. I expect these fellows are going to uh, uh, eventually uh, judge me on my merit, not on my age. Senator-elect Joe Biden, it seemed, had a bright future ahead of him. If he stays in the Senate till the end of this century, he'll be 57, the average age of senators now. But less than a month later, a week before Christmas 1972, Biden's wife, Nelia, was driving home from buying the family Christmas tree in the car, four-year-old Beau, three-year-old Hunter, and 18-month-old Amy. Their station wagon was T-boned by a tractor trailer. Nelia and Amy were killed in the wreck. Beau and Hunter were critically injured, but survived. Joe Biden flew home from Washington and considered resigning from the Senate before even being sworn in. Instead, though, he committed to trying to serve while caring for his boys. I hope that I can be a good senator for you all. I make this one promise that uh, if in six months or so there's a conflict between my being a good father and being a good senator, which I hope will not occur, I thought would, but I hope it won't, uh, I promise you that I will uh, will contact Governor-elect Tribbett as I had earlier and. Uh, tell him that uh, we can always get another senator, but they can't get another father. Joe Biden caught the train home from Washington to Delaware every night to be with his sons as they recovered. By the time he stood for re-election six years later, he'd married Jill. They had a daughter, Ashley, in 1981. Senator Biden built his reputation, particularly in foreign affairs, and in 1987, as the Reagan era drew to a close, the 44-year-old announced he was running for president. The next president of the United States has a phenomenal opportunity to make a contribution to this country in a way that's going to make life better for our children. After a promising start, Biden's campaign was soon in trouble. He had a habit of saying things like, When I marched in the civil rights movement, I marched with tens of thousands of others to change attitudes. But he wasn't in any civil rights marches, even if he supported the movement. And then it was this. Why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university. Why is it that my wife who's sitting out there in the audience is the first in her family to ever go to college? Biden had quoted British Labor leader Neil Kinnock with attribution many times on the campaign trail, but in that debate in Iowa, he did not attribute it. The rival Dukakis campaign distributed videotapes of Kinnock to reporters accusing Biden of plagiarism. More examples of uncredited quotes and Biden's exaggerations emerged. Within a week, he dropped out of the presidential race to oversee the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing for Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork. There will be other opportunities for me to campaign for president, but there will not be many other opportunities for me to influence President Reagan's choice on the Supreme Court. Then, in early 1988, after complaining of headaches and neck pain, an aneurysm in Biden's brain burst, nearly killing him. Biden survived, but it would be 20 years before he again set his sights on the White House. That second bid ended without great controversy or many votes, 
The 65-year-old's presidential hopes finally seemed over when he accepted the consolation prize of being the younger Barack Obama's running mate. After eight years as vice president, Biden considered running for the top job again, despite Hillary Clinton being the overwhelming favourite. But those plans changed when his son Beau died of a brain tumour in 2015. Joe Biden said the grieving process had closed the window on a campaign. I know from previous experience that there is no timetable for this process. The process doesn't respect or much care about things like filing deadlines or debates and primaries and caucuses. Once again, that seemed like the end. But four years later, with Donald Trump in the White House, Joe Biden was back for one last try. The single most important thing we have to accomplish is defeat Donald Trump. The bruising campaign would see Biden's age and mental acuity questioned and his family attacked, but somehow 2020 finally proved to be his year. After a lifetime of setbacks and loss, an old man with plenty of flaws, plenty of experience and empathy was suddenly in tune with a deeply divided nation suffering under a deadly pandemic. Joe Biden had finally met the moment, or perhaps the moment had met Joe Biden. Well, Trump might be struggling to come to terms with losing, but that's not the fault of Fox News. Laura Ingraham has taken to seemingly counselling Trump over the airwaves. Losing, if that's what happens, it's awful. But President Trump's legacy will only become more significant if he focuses on moving the country forward. And then the love and respect his supporters feel for him, it's only going to grow stronger. And his legacy? more historically significant. And that Trump-friendly style of news presentation has even inspired other news outlets. This is the ABC's Washington local broadcast. I'm Elise Morgan. In breaking news tonight, it's actually great that President Trump hasn't conceded yet. Sources say it shows strength and the president should be proud of his accomplishments. In other politics news, it's boring. Experts say there's never been a better time to get out of politics on account of how boring it really is. The 2020 Masters kicks off tomorrow. The prestigious tournament is a great watch to unwind and a reminder that having more free time would be the perfect opportunity to work on your swing. The financial markets show that fighting for the silent majority is down and screw it, you don't deserve me is up. The Dow is also surging. Dow, of course, standing for doing the opposite of winning. There's never been a worse time to be a winner. In pop culture news, the hottest new trend with America's youth is coming to terms with reality. It's the fad that's sweeping the nation. Truly the coolest thing someone can do. The weather forecast tomorrow is for long sustained periods of Fox News watching with occasional patches of cheeseburger. And here's a monkey who's friends with a puppy. Just something to think about if you start feeling angry and want to hold a press conference. And that's ABC's Washington local broadcast. It's going to be OK. President Trump's election night party seems to have turned into another White House super spreader event. First... Now, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and some campaign aides have tested positive for coronavirus. And among the others to fall ill after the election night party, David Bossie, the man tasked with heading up the president's legal strategy. Oops. And then... U.S. Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson has now tested positive for COVID-19. Meanwhile, President-elect Biden got down to business yesterday convening a coronavirus transition advisory board. As you work toward a safe and effective vaccine, we know the single most effective thing we can do to stop the spread of COVID is wear a mask. And on that vaccine front, Chaz, there was some very encouraging news this week, although the surge in new cases at the moment continues to be really alarming. Yeah, you're not kidding about the case numbers being alarming. The average new cases per day is now over 120,000 and racing up. They were at 135,000 just today. Texas has just had its one millionth case and those cases are going up everywhere. These are per capita new cases in the West. The northeast started poorly, not so bad now. The south was where the second wave hit hard and it's back again. And now look at the Midwest. It's completely out of control. 
Yes, it's true that there are more tests than ever, about 1.3 million tests a day, but the percentage of tests that are coming back positive is also increasing. They're up to 8% nationally. Now, of course, we know the thing that everyone really worries about isn't so much cases as hospitalizations, but they are going horribly as well. Hospitalizations are just nudging 60,000, which is as bad as it has been all pandemic. And ICU occupancy rates in places like Minneapolis are up to 98%. Now, this is when the deaths start to add up, when the hospital system is under pressure. And the average daily deaths are indeed back over 1,000 a day. There were 1,300 deaths today. Yes, that is still a lot better than during the first wave, but things are likely to get a fair bit worse yet. So it's a worry. OK, what about that good news that John mentioned? Well, Pfizer reported on Monday that its vaccine has been found to be more than 90% effective in its final stage of clinical trials. So that is fantastic news. It still needs to collect some more data to comply with safety standards, but Pfizer is expected to apply for an emergency use authorization later this month, which could see it becoming widely available in early 2021. So that is great. Although, even as that news breaks, Denmark has discovered mutant strains of the virus in its mink population. And these mutant strains have different spike proteins. That's the part of the virus that the immune response and vaccines target. That doesn't make the virus more dangerous, but it does make vaccines less effective. All 17 million Danish mink are going to be killed because of this. The question is whether these mutant strains are going to be contained. When Trump said the virus would go away after the election, he was very wrong. Indeed he was, Chaz. That is all the time for this penultimate trip to Planet America for 2020. We'll see you back here next Wednesday night, same time, 9.30, for our final show of the year. Don't forget we also have our penultimate fireside chat this Friday night on ABC News. You can find both shows on ABC iView, YouTube and Facebook. And if you want some more interminable musings about the election, I put another podcast up on Monday right there. Good night.